Hello and welcome to Lara Nara. If you've watched our last video, you know that even papayas, yes, that's right, a fruit now has tested positive for COVID-19. Or more specifically for SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes the supposedly COVID-19. So the question is, how can this be? Is it because the laboratory didn't work properly or is it a more profound problem than explains those results? We will find out in this presentation. But before we do that, a short reminder, please, if you enjoy this kind of uh, content where we talk about holistic health, Support our work by liking, sharing and subscribing and also do not forget to hit the notifications button so you don't miss out on the weekly content that appears here. And always keep in mind throughout this presentation that even if all the experts agree, they may well be mistaken. So let's answer the question to be or not to be. And in order to answer this question of how even a papaya and tigers and other animals that should not test positive for COVID-19 have tested positive for COVID-19, we need to look at the procedure of testing for a virus. Because the world is suffering from a massive delusion based on the belief that a test for RNA is a test for a deadly new virus. A virus that uh, supposedly has emerged from wild bats or other animals in China. If this virus exists, or any virus for the matter, then it should be possible to purify viral particles. And from these particles we should be able to extract the RNA and match it to the RNA used in the test. Until this is done, it is possible that the RNA comes from another source which could be the cells of the patient, bacteria, fungi, etc. There might be an association with elevated levels of this RNA and illness, but this is still not proof that the RNA is from a virus. And without purification and characterization of virus particles, it just cannot be accepted that an RNA test is proof for a virus. Why is that so? Let's find out. So scientists are detecting this novel RNA in multiple patients with influenza or pneumonia-like conditions right now and they assume that the detection of RNA, which is believed to be wrapped in proteins to form uh, RNA virus, as coronaviruses are believed to be, is equivalent to isolation of the virus. It is not. And one of the groups of scientists in a, in a scientific paper was honest enough to admit this. They said, quote, we did not perform tests for detecting infectious virus in blood, end quote. Another recently published scientific paper quietly admitted also that, quote, our study does not obey Koch's postulates. What are Koch's postulates? Well, they were first stated by the German bacteriologist Robert Koch in the late 1800s. They are very simple and logic and they can be summarized as following and they apply to all kinds of pathogen testing procedures. First step is you separate and purify the pathogen. Second step is you expose susceptible animals to the separated pathogen. The third step is you verify that the same illness is produced and uh, some uh, even add that you should also repurify the pathogen just to be sure that it really is creating the illness. The famous virologist Thomas Rivers stated already in a 1936 speech, quote, it is obvious that Koch's postulates have not been satisfied in viral diseases. End quote. And of course, that was a long time ago, but this problem still persists till today. None of the scientists so far have even attempted to purify the virus. 
And the word isolation has been so debased by virologists, it means literally nothing nowadays. So when you read those articles that yeah, the SARS-CoV-2 has been isolated, it's not what you assume. For example, they add sometimes impure materials to a cell culture and uh, they interpret cell death uh, as isolation. So when they have not isolated the virus, how do they detect this virus? What kind of test procedure do they use? Well, the COVID-19 test is based on PCR, which is a DNA manufacturing technique. When PCR is used as a test, it does not produce a positive or negative result. Instead, it simply counts the number of cycles required to detect sufficient material to beat the arbitrary cutoff between positive and negative. Uh, if positive means infected and negative means uninfected, then there are cases of people that go from infected to uninfected and back again to infected in just a couple of days. And this has been documented already also with COVID-19. There is no proof that a virus is being detected by the PCR test and while there should be, there is absolutely no concern right now about whether there are a significant number of false positives on the test, which have been documented again with COVID-19. What is published therefore in the medical journals is not science. Every paper has the goal of enhancing the panic by interpreting the data only in ways that benefit the viral theory, even when the data is confusing or contradictory. In other words, we can regard the medical papers, most of them, as pure propaganda. In order to understand why we have a problem here with the testing technology, we need to gain a more profound understanding of how exactly this RT-PCR testing technology works and where its limitations are. So this is based on PCR, as the name says already, which stands for polymerase chain reaction. This is a DNA manufacturing technique that was invented by Kerry Mullis who received a Chemistry Nobel Prize for it in 1993. How does it work? You start with one DNA strand and the strand is then cleaved, so it is split into two, and then complementary strands are allowed to grow from it, uh, which is the same process that occurs in a cell during cell division, also known as mitosis. And if this process is repeated 10 times, you will have about 1000 identical strands of DNA and each round of doubling is referred to as a cycle. To use PCR as a test, you assume that you are starting with an unknown number of strands and end up with an exponential multiple after a number of cycles. From the quantity of materials, a termination the starting quantity can then be estimated. A major problem with this is that because PCR is an exponential multiplication process, errors also can grow exponentially. In reality, the starting quantity is often not estimated, but the optical density or another characteristic of the growing pile of DNA uh, that can be determined. Another problem with many viruses like the coronaviruses is that they are believed to be composed of RNA, but this can be solved by converting all RNA into DNA with the reverse transcriptase enzyme at the start of the process. And hence we have this RT nomenclature in the, in the test name as well. That's why it's called RT-PCR, standing for reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction. The technology after these two adaptations uh, is therefore this reverse transcript test PCR. Another problem that we have with the RT-PCR test is the number of cycles, so the number of uh, cleavages, the splits of the DNA. 
In a review of 33 tests approved by the FDA under emergency conditions in this COVID-19 situation, where a PCR cycle number cutoff was recommended, the number of cycles varied wildly. Manufacturers recommended everything from 30, 31, 35, uh, up to 40, uh, which was the most popular, chosen by 12 manufacturers, and two even recommended a cutoff value of 43 and 45 cycles. The MIQE guidelines recommend that data with 40 or more cycles should be discarded, and some even feel that 35 is a much better cutoff value. Among other problems, background fluorescence also will build up and can produce a false positive with enough cycles. In an audio interview, RT-PCR expert Professor Stephen Buston stated that cycles should probably be limited to 35. The MIQE guidelines for use and reporting of RT-PCR, of which Bustin was a member, by the way, warns that uh, CQs or the PCR cycle values higher than 40 are suspect because of the implied low efficiency and generally should be reported, specifically warning of the risk of false positives, which we see a lot with the COVID-19 tests. Being arbitrary, those cutoff values, is not the only problem with the use of the cycle number. The values are not comparable between labs and will also vary within a lab, especially if even minor changes to the process are made. Even such minute changes as using clear plastic tubes instead of white plastic tubes. So this test is also extremely sensitive to the conditions and the parameters. But those are unfortunately not the only problems with the RT-PCR test. In the same review of the approved RT-PCR test for COVID-19 by the FDA, they showed also that um, they have a wide range of differences in what the tests were looking for and how they decided whether they had found a virus. The tests look for a variety of different segments, so genes of the presumed SARS-CoV-2 genome that only amounts to about 1% or less of the total genome, which is about 30,000 bases long. Perhaps the worst feature of the tests is how they decide whether the sample is positive if more than one segment is being looked for. Some tests look for only one segment for a positive test. Tests that look for two segments are split between those that require both to be present and those that require either one to be present for a positive result. And some tests even look for three segments but require only two to be present while one test even insisted on all three to be present. Tests that allow a segment to be undetected raise the question of how it can be said that the virus was detected when an important part of it was missing. And we have another problem as well. Because apparently from all the tests we know that RNA quantity does not equal illness. How can that be? Because theoretically the PCR cycle number at which DNA is detectable tells us the relative quantity of RNA. Whatever initial amount was necessary to be detectable on the 20th cycle, let's say the 21st cycle should be doubly sensitive and could detect about half as much and 30 cycles about 1000 times as much as the 21st cycle. One could therefore expect that sicker people have more viruses and thus to have a lower cycle uh, number on testing. The problem is that this is not happening. The first six people, for example, in the graph on the left, were sick enough to require oxygen. But one can clearly see from the graph that the six sicker people did not have distinctly higher quantities of RNA or any other consistent difference in their test graph. The majority of the 18 patients that were tested in this study had a positive test followed by a negative test followed by a positive test again 
and some had this switch several times. If a negative test means uninfected, then this is simply not possible. You cannot rid yourself of the virus and then be reinfected the next day and then infected the day after again and then become uninfected again, etc. etc. Or if rapid reinfection is possible in a hospital setting, then the virus must be simply everywhere and fighting it is totally useless. The simplest answer to this conundrum is that negative tests do not mean uninfected. But a corollary is that positive tests also do not mean infected, which would make the test itself worthless. In a survey of RNA-positive people in Guangdong, China, scientists examined the viral load, so the quantity of RNA, and concluded that, quote, the viral load that was detected in the asymptomatic patient was similar to that in the symptomatic patient. How strange. Another problem is that we see symptoms below the cutoff values, so when people are supposed to be not infected. Another paper uh, that contains a series of frequent tests, one to five uh, days apart, for five European patients, uh, showed that the PCR result, expressed in this case as the estimated number of copies of RNA, went to undetectable usually this is interpreted as negative or uninfected, 3 to 11 days before the cessation of symptoms. And that implies that the virus was causing illness when it was not present. Here you see on the left a graph of a patient with symptoms serious enough to justify the prescription of the antiviral drug Redemsevir, who was COVID-19 negative, so uninfected for 11 days before symptoms resolved. The PCR test is ultra sensitive as we've seen, so it is very hard to sustain the idea that the virus was still present. So we are using a test to determine whether somebody is COVID-19 positive that has admitted limitations and those limitations have even been stated in recently published scientific papers. For example, a paper from Singapore by doctors and public health officials provides a revealing look at the limitations of this type of testing methodology. Hidden away in the supplementary material, where very few people will see it of course, it exposes some important issues with the tests. First issue, the test, they state, is not binary, so it does not give you a clear negative or positive result and it also has, as we have discussed already, an arbitrary cutoff value, the number of cycles. The quantity also, the second issue that they admit to, of RNA does not correlate with illness. We've discussed this as well and it is admitted here. Also, if negative means uninfected and positive means infected, then people went from infected to uninfected and back again, and this happened several times in some cases. Also, results below the cutoff are not shown and are treated as negative. But, on the other hand, if PCR continued past the cutoff and was eventually positive, this would indicate the presence of small quantities of the virus RNA, which is supposedly unique to COVID-19, and so this would be a clear positive, meaning the patient is infected. Conclusions then. Without purification and re-exposing the animals to viral particles, we simply do not know if the virus is pathogenic, so whether it is disease-causing or not. It could just be an opportunistic infection that invades unhealthy people with weakened immune systems. Or it could be a passenger virus that is carried along by risky behavior such as eating an animal carrier of this virus. We don't know the false positive rate of the test also without validating a large number of positive tests by attempting again to purify the virus. 
every positive test for which the virus could not be purified would be a false positive and every negative test for which the virus could be purified would be a false negative. But the virus has not yet been purified, so test validation is impossible at this stage. If someone is sick, there is simply no proof, therefore, that any or all of their symptoms are due to the virus, even if the virus is present or exists at all. Some people may be immune. Some may have some symptoms caused by the virus, but others uh, could have the same symptoms uh, caused by drugs they are given or by pre-existing health conditions and so on and so forth. We don't know if the people who test negative are infected or not, especially when they show up with similar symptoms. Testing at such an early stage of knowledge is therefore incredibly dangerous. It spreads panic, it can put people on dangerous medications, and other circumstances of their treatment can be physically as well as psychologically extremely damaging, such as the intubation, the isolation, and even seeing all the doctors and nurses in special suits around you, uh, emphasizing, of course, psychologically how dangerous the situation is and how close to death you might be. And you hear it very often in the media that the COVID-19 illness is easily recognized. But, as we have seen, how can, is it so easily recognized? We use a test of unknown accuracy with many admitted limitations. We have admitted problems with false positives and negatives. And also on top of that, this strange new disease called COVID-19 has absolutely none of its own symptoms because fever, coughing and abnormal lung images could stem from other illnesses as well. Just a normal flu would give you very similar symptoms. So ask yourself next time when you hear that, yes, those people are clearly COVID-19 patients, whether it is so clear cut. With all that being said, I hope that you've enjoyed this presentation. If you did so, please support our work by liking, sharing and subscribing. And also do not forget to hit the notifications button so you don't miss out on the weekly content that appears on this channel. And until next time, stay healthy.